Hello, I'm Robin Vincent and here's what's hot in the world of computer music technology for the August edition of Modern Music Monthly. What with the holidays and everything, I'm really quite surprised I was able to squeeze this one out. So while the tent's drying on the lawn and the after sun is starting to uh, just take the edge off things, here's what's caught my eye this month. Archeria's Keystep plugs into everything. Sonar gets skinned. Did the Windows 10 anniversary update ruin all your performance? Plugin Alliance get nasty with the unfiltered audio Dent. We have a massive 3D wavetable thing with Tone 2's Icarus. M Audio finally release a couple of audio interfaces. The Cosmoff for Stochastic synth gets an update. Open Labs announce the forthcoming Stagelight version 3. Traction peel back the skin of biotech and roll and go new product bonkers crazy that'll do let's get to it i'm finding myself increasingly drawn out of the box to find new and interesting ways to combine hardware and software one of the challenges is how to bridge that gap how to integrate midi and modular digital and analog archeria keystep is one such bridging device and I think it's pretty cool, although pretty is not what it is. It looks like an old Roland PC controller keyboard from before the last millennium. But looks aside, it's a keyboard that has an integrated step sequencer that can control both analog and digital gear. It's a love it, hate it, Marmite kind of slim keyboard, which can then pump out controller data via USB, MIDI, or CV and gate. So you can finally sync up your lovely modular synth with your door or with your MIDI sound module. Who has those anymore? You can spin through eight sequence of memories and control a whole load of stuff on the fly. You can edit sequences while you play. It also has a chord and arpeggiator mode. For 99 quid, it's a seriously handy device, I think. Although it's not anywhere near as powerful as its big brother, the BeatStep Pro, but that's sort of like twice the price. I wonder slightly if it has actually enough power to run a performance by itself but it's a really interesting way to sort of get into that world of combining laptop, modular, synths, sequencing and stuff. Now, I'm not totally sure if this is interesting or not, but it appears that Cakewalk have introduced a kind of theme editor for Sonar. I mean, Sonar is one of the most dreary looking doors on the planet. I've never liked it. Whatever they seem to do to revitalize their GUI it just always looks kind of a bit crap. So a theme editor, you would have thought, would be an awesome idea. The thing is, is that it looks terribly time consuming and complex to get into. I mean, you can change individual colors, simple enough, but then you actually have to go through and change every sort of graphic and image and every button. And actually, personally, that sounds like an awful lot of work to me. So will anyone actually be bothered to go through all this? Well, maybe, I mean, hopefully some enterprising, young, nerdy person will spend their entire life creating themes that other Sonar users can use. I mean, I think that's the way forward, really, because the normal punter, I just, I don't think will find the time or the energy to want to tweak their interface that much. So it's like one of those great things. It's a great idea, superb piece of work, Cakewalk. I just, I'm just not convinced that anyone's actually going to make any use of it. It's also interesting how the Cakewalk subscription model is, is sort of coming along. I mean, one of the, the problems with it is you no longer have these big releases. You have this kind of trickle effect of updates and new features being bolted in all the time, which is great if you're a user. But on the other hand, it doesn't give them an opportunity to say, hey, wow, look at all this new stuff that's in Sonar. It just kind of evolves along. And so it's a little bit lost as far as sort of news feed and media coverage goes, which is a shame because they're sticking in good stuff kind of all the time. And perhaps therefore it's, it's my fault for not being interested enough. It was rumored or even stated by Steinberg that some people may experience a performance drop after the Windows 10 anniversary update. That was quite an alarming statement. So I decided to run a whole bunch of tests. Now I left it a bit late and so sort of the night before the update was due, I frantically went around trying to come up with some benchmark tests on both my desktop and my Surface Pro 4. Then the next day after the update had 
pushed itself onto all my computers, I tried all the same tests again. And honestly, the results were that I couldn't measure a difference. I could not find a difference in performance anywhere. There was, you know, sometimes up, sometimes down, but you know, if you rebooted and then tried the test again, it would sort of fall the other way. So it all kind of fell into the margin of error, really. So whatever Steinberg were talking about, I couldn't really find. Cubase does now crash when I exit it, but that's probably something I just need to look at. And the only other thing to report on the update really is that it does install, or rather it allows a whole load of apps to now run in the background, which weren't there previously which is great if you want notifications on how well you're doing in Candy Crush, but for most of us, we just want to turn those things off, which is simple to do. My plugin of the month is Unfiltered Audio Dent from Plugin Alliance. It's a deliciously sort of nasty distortion plugin that seems to radiate sort of abuse and anger. A couple of weeks before that, they released a plugin called Indent, which is sort of like a, a little brother of Dent, and it had a similar sort of spitting, horrid, nasty destruction kind of feel to it. And it was free just for a couple of weeks. And so jumped on that, had a lovely time. And when the big brother came out, when Dent arrived, of course, I had no choice but to buy it. And it was a very clever bit of marketing. Really not sure about the name though. I mean, Dent just seems far too polite. It's like having a little gentle car accident. Uh, when you go, oh, I'm sorry, so I just seem to have dented your side door there. Oh, not to worry, I'll get that sorted out. When it's not like that at all, it's a crash, it's a riot, it's, you know, it's stuff bashing into each other with mayhem and arms and limbs flying everywhere. It's that kind of plug-in, so no, Dent doesn't really do it for me as a name. Anyway, it crushes bits all over the place, it squares off waves left, right and centre, it folds them into different kind of spatial dimensions, and then it throws in a bunch of LFOs which can wang everything all over the place. In the middle you've got this amazing sort of black and white display which goes Wah! at you and ah, ugh, ah, it's just slapping you about with its ferociousness. It's a great plugin. I love it. I mean, of course, you can use it gently. You can use it for a little bit of coloration or a little bit of, of boost. But then, you know, only if you're a real wimp, what you really want to do is wang it all up and get it <coughs> at you, because I think that's what it's best at, personally. Sadly, Indent is no longer free. It's about $49. And the real thing, Dent is about $99. But either one, is definitely worth it. Go and check it out. This is one of those, it's the most powerful synth ever type of things. Uh, Tone 2, in sort of very sedate marketing speak, have declared Icarus to be the most extraordinary thing you will ever do. Not only will it revitalize your love life, I imagine, but it'll also get you to release a hit record. I mean, days after using it, you will be spewing hit records from all sorts of orifices and stuff. It's a wavetable synth. It sounds great. It's got lots of wavetables in that, and it has this kind of unique way of morphing between waveforms within a wavetable, and you can apply one to another to mess that one about, and then resave that, and then get that reapplied to something else. So it's very possible to start with quite a simple selection of waves, or a simple wavetable starting point, and rapidly morph that into a very complex and, I guess, interesting soundscape. It has some very deep level editing inside it where you can get into waveforms and spectrums and lay that whole thing out. Probably more complex than it needs to be. Well, at least perhaps too complex for most people who are gonna be using it. However, it comes with a whole bunch of really interesting sounds and the interface is great, it's laid out well, it's clear, it's easy to use and it sounds impressive. The most powerful thing ever? No, I don't think so, but as a wavetable synth, when you consider alternatives like those from Waldorf, it's got some real potential for making something a bit more interesting. It's $199, which, considering how many hit records it's gonna make you, that doesn't seem like a lot. Originally announced back in January at NAMM, a whole new range of M-Audio audio interfaces. They look great, desktop form factor, big chunky boxes of stuff, and they've been completely absent ever since. However, recently, the 2x2 and 2x2M sort of appeared on their website and now, finally, they have been released. Now the 2x2 and the 2x2M are almost identical in 
pretty much every respect. The only difference being on connections. The 2x2 has a single mic line combi input and an instrument input. The 2x2M has two mic inputs, two instrument inputs, and also has a MIDI interface built on as well. However, the difference in price is only 20 quid, and I can't quite work out why anyone would want the cheaper one. I mean, okay, it's cheaper, but for an extra 20 quid, you get twice the inputs plus a MIDI interface, and that by itself would be enough to justify the price. So I can't quite get my head around what M-Audio are sort of thinking really just get the good one get the bigger one get the nice one why get the other one <laughs> i mean the price point is really aggressive I mean, it's 79 pounds for the 2x2 99 for the 2x2m so they really are trying to throw themselves in there as the best entry level audio interface and it could well be that but they don't need the 79 could one Anyway, otherwise, it's a desktop unit box. It's got a nice big knob in the middle that only controls volume. It doesn't do anything else that's clever. And it's made of nice, rugged metal and stuff, a few knobs. Nice, lovely. I mean, if the drivers are as good as the M-Audio drivers used to be, then it could be a fantastic entry-level audio interface. They are, however, pretty chunky. I mean, for a 2x2 two -two interface, it's taken up a lot of desk space. I mean, I love the tabletop desktop form factor. That's my favorite way of having an audio interface. They just seem a little large. There's a lot of blank metal on the front and the back. And you wonder whether they could have just slimmed it down, perhaps a little bit. But who knows? It comes with a big bundle of Air software, as that's all under the same company these days and should be available now. So what the heck is this thing? Perhaps it's a seamless continuum with increased density events over a topological sonic texture. Perhaps it's something to do with random probability distributions. Perhaps you could imagine the sonic being as a multi-dimensional vector in space. The composer then can continuously vary it in the timbre space within the coupling of continuous onset of time, duration and density, forging transformations with frequency, amplitude, microtombra and spatialization fundamentals. The sound that emerges is kind of strange and complex, and the interface is probably the most awesome thing I've ever seen. It's like some part of the bridge of the Star Trek Enterprise. I mean, I wouldn't have a clue how to work it, but it sort of looks and sounds like a continuously evolving work of art. Anyway, there's a new version. It's out now. Here's an old favorite of mine, Stage Light, so that fabulously touchy door from Open Labs. It will shortly be hitting version three. They sent out a newsletter inviting users to try out the beta version, which is always a good sign that the new version is not too far off. There aren't a lot of details at the moment, but the biggest thing is that it has a mixer. Hooray, a mixer. It's the thing I've been asking them for all along and they've done it just like I said they should. You know, pull out those individual bits that you have on each track and just slap it into a console shape. That's what they've done. They've also added send effects and you have as many of those as you like. So the routing within it is gonna get a lot more interesting. They've also provided support for OS X. I mean, why would you do that? Why would you do that? It's a touch enabled, you know, touch savvy door. OS X has got nothing to do with that. It's kind of a strange thing. I mean, I guess, it allows them to enter into that market. But hey, it's an Apple thing. I don't know. I don't know anything about that stuff. It, it could be awesome. Who knows? You probably have to control it with your mind uh, in OS X. That's probably what it is. Anyway, I'm really looking forward to it. So uh, I'm going to be checking out the beta as soon as I can. In fact, that's probably the beta happening down here right now. Traction released their beguiling organic synth biotech at the beginning of the year. It is a beautiful thing full of lots of really interesting sound library that kind of evolved and moved and you had this wonderful tree thingy in the middle that you could move about that morphed from one sound to another. It was kind of essentially an XY pad I suppose but it didn't look like one, it looked lovely. But I always thought that the editing side was a little bit shallow. You couldn't really do a whole lot to it. And so Traction have just released version 1.5, which completely takes the lid off. They have peeled back the skin of biotech to reveal this kind of fleshy, sticky loveliness of parameters, modifiers, and modulation. It looks just as fabulous as the front page always did. I love the way that the waveforms appear and move behind all the oscillator controls and change as you change things. 
Each sound layer is composed of four oscillators which can use FM synthesis or virtual analog or physical modeling or samples. You can have as many sound layers as you like so it's possible to build up an extraordinarily complex sound. Apparently the modulation matrix gives you 200 routes of modulation via 32 routes to modifiers and there's eight flow LFOs that create such enormous mathematical possibilities that they believe it could actually be capable of generating life in organic randomness. Groovy. And finally, flirting with hardware as I like to do, Roland have announced a huge party on the 9th of September to celebrate the 33 year anniversary of the release of their 909 drum machine. They are giving us a 24 hour live streamed event covering a whole bunch of new products. 32 products they plan to release on this day, covering pianos, bagpipes, spoons, washboards, I don't know, percussion and stuff. But there are five new synthesizers in there. Now, will they be like the boutique synthesizers? Will they be the modular stuff that they've got into? Or will they be these sort of crappy, big, garish digital things that they seem to like? I don't know, I'm hoping for the kind of the modular, the boutique and the slightly interesting stuff. Modern Roland synths, for me, tend to overwhelm me with the sound, with the, the digital nature and the way that they, they kind of behave more like home keyboards than dedicated synthesizers. However, with things like the Aria project, if you can get past the green, those things are really interesting. And the new System 500 stuff, the modular and the boutique things. Yeah, yeah, that's really exciting. So amongst all of the weirdness that they'll be releasing on this day, hopefully there'll be some real peaches. They also have a completely brand new category that they're adding a product to. So could that be software related? Don't know, who knows? Could be a saxophone, you just don't know. Could be a bull roarer on a piece of string they're gonna wang round that's got Roland stamped on it. You just don't know with these guys. So we'll look forward to that. That's on the 9th of September. Go and check out their website. So keep an eye out for news of the new range of Molten Music Technology audio PCs. Hmm, yes, we have something hatching. So if you're in the market for a new audio PC, just hold off for a little bit longer. Sign up to us, subscribe, you know, newsletters, get in touch, see us on Facebook, Twitter, that kind of thing. So we're just right in the middle of putting together a new lineup of what will obviously become the only audio PC worth spending any time with. So that's very exciting. Well, that's it for the summer. Don't forget to subscribe and all that jazz. Share us about if you like this video. If you like what I do here, then let me know. Let your friends know, let your colleagues know. Push it as spam to as many people as you can possibly find. And if there's any new stuff that's caught your eye, let me know in the comments below. I always answer comments. I'm kind of like really into it. So if you want to talk to me, you can directly in this YouTube video on the comments below. Or if not, go via any other means possible. I always try to answer comments and questions and emails as much as I possibly can. Don't be afraid. I'm not scary. But in the meantime, go and make some tunes. <laughs>